Uh, uh, Jack? Ah, same old shit. So, I just thought we'd wait a little while for, for people to come on. There's, there's a few. You can see. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you see the 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 uh, questions and whatnot? Questions? Yeah. Do you oh, see? Oh yeah, questions? yeah. The comments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you see one, tag it while we're talking. Okay. So um, I guess anybody following along who doesn't know who you are, Taylor. I thought I'd just get that out of the way and ask where in the world you are and why you're there. All right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in L.A., Los Angeles. Uh, pretty much lived here forever. Okay. And, uh, building uh, custom furniture since 2012 professionally and uh, casually making other things since I was 16. Okay, so a, a, life, a life position that you recognize right away. More or less, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I studied uh, architecture in college. Uh, it was a five-year program and... Uh, and what degree did you, did you have? Did you have a bachelor's of architecture? Yeah, or? I was a bachelor's, yeah. Okay. It's probably the single toughest thing I've ever done. Yeah, that's a pretty serious that's a pretty serious school. I never, I never went to school for that, but studied it. And so uh, it's, it's something I don't think you can appreciate unless you do study. It, it, it's, it's, people, don't, people don't seek out great architecture without having learned what, what that is. It, it's a desire that's created from learning. So to me, that, that's... That's what architecture is. Um, yeah, it's about it's about uh, three all nighters a week for five years. And did you love it? Um, I did. I did love it. It was, uh, you know, some 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 semesters were better than others, uh, depending on the professor and sort of whatever projects we had going on at the time. But uh, do you think you found who you were more by doing that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I found who I was during one of those years, and it was towards the end, my fourth year, where uh, I took a study abroad course in Asia. Okay. And we, we traveled through Asia for a little over three months, including um, uh, a month and a half spent studying in, in a university in Malaysia. But... Uh, I really found my biggest passion while traveling through Japan and seeing all of the uh, the traditional temples and uh, joinery and kind of wood being used sort of architecturally. Once you learn what good is, then you can see it actually when you look at famous buildings. So I guess one question for me would be how is it that you do furniture and, and not the actual structures? I mean, there's been a lot of cases where architects have entered into the furniture world because of scale or other things. I know George Nakashima uh, is a, as, a, as an example. Do you, do you see any parallels there where you didn't venture into architecture in terms of you know buildings and space and stuff like that? more into the sculpture of furniture. So, uh, loosely answering your question, I mean, I graduated into the recession. Um, oh. No jobs in the architecture world were really um, available, even the ones that some of my professors had promised. Right. Uh, just because there was no work really happening. So... Uh, and that recession was, what, the dot-com? Uh, that's 2008. I graduated 2010, oh, yeah. so we were okay. kind of feeling the effects of it pretty hard back then. And yeah, it uh, it hard. And I, I just faced the age-old question of like, how do you get a client to 
trust you to build a building when you've never built one before. And, yeah. and I had even had some potential clients who had, you know, offered some projects to me that were clearly way over my head. Okay. Um, they started asking about permits and I had never even been to the permit office or the LADBS, Department of Building Safety. So um, I started questioning myself and my skills and all those hours that I put into studying architecture in school. And I was like, what was that even worth if I don't even know how to build a building, really? I learned kind of how to design them, but that's about it. So, okay, well, can I say something? Because I really don't think the school teaches architects to draw plans for permits. No, I, I no, was, no, I mean, no, no, no school teaches you how to be a professional in, in any working capacity. It's more of teaching you what the career is, is really about and preparing you for that. So in the case of this career is um, pulling all nighters, becoming passionate yeah. about your work and, and using that passion to fuel uh, the, the troubles and overcoming them yeah i mean i i would and problem solving fundamentally still today isn't architect being an architect and a doctor uh sort of that same elitism this is a a high elite thing and i mean it, and, and rightfully so i don't know if you're of the opinion but to me architecture is the highest art form and i i guess the way i would describe it is um you know, painting is two dimensional and you, you can paint and, and, and um, describe vision in two dimensions. And then, and then you can have a sculpture, which is a higher level do sculpture, huh. um, who, where you can view that art form as a participant circling it and seeing the light. But then architecture is one where the participant is inside of the sculpture hmm. and um, it can move their spirit. So I know much of your work does that for me. Did any of that sort of thing influence the way that, or old architectures from the past, or, or any mentors of the past, famous architects that you, you sort of thought, you know what, that's, I, I, I get into the way that guy thinks, or this guy. Well, so like in terms of the history of architecture, you have like the Roman architects who were really designing, engineering and playing the role of the contractor and in some cases the craftsman. So, I mean, that was the epitome of architecture, like probably the highest peak of and the- when did uh, you talk about Athens, you mean? What's that? Are you talking about Athens, you mean? Well, like, I'm talking about like the Pantheon in, in Rome, a lot oh. of the Roman architects. Uh, where they were really defying gravity, um, tradition, constantly pushing for innovation and, and things like that. Perfect. Uh, perfect proportion. Yeah, yeah. But, but they were also playing the role of the engineer, which today has been pretty much totally separated and perhaps rightfully so. Um, so that the architect can really focus on the design and let those who are, are, you know, diversified in order to be really the best at their particular task uh, to build those buildings and, and sort of make whatever shapes happen um, and let the architect play the role of more or less the visionary. But to me, that was a little bit too um, separated from the reality. I, I didn't like you know, drawing and then sending things out and then they would disappear into a black hole or get bastardized by bad decisions from a contractor or, you know, cut in price because of a client's uh, budget and whatnot. So I, I sought more control over everything that I was doing, which is sort of how I got into furniture. You know, an architect designs a building and maybe... Um, two to five or sometimes 10 years later, the building actually appears. And that to me is just such a grueling, grueling process. Um, <laughs> architects are essentially masochists in that regard, but. I totally agree with you. But, but as a furniture maker. Um, I'm coming from the opposite direction. So 
architecture. I was doing furniture and the problem with doing furniture was nobody wants a table. They want it in, they want, I mean a grand table or a grand piece uh, unless it's within the architecture. And they'll listen to designers and they'll listen to architects. So I discovered that if I really wanted to do furniture and have clients, I needed to do the space. I needed to design the space. And then they would say, what type of, what type of uh, table should go in there? And then of course I could design the table and, and, and build it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that, that kind of makes me think like, so my approach, I actually had intended when I started making furniture to get back into architecture. And my idea was I can't convince a client to let me design or build a building, but if I start building the furniture within the building, I can show them how I could transform their space with objects and then ultimately convince them that I would be able to design a building that would have the same level of impact as a piece of furniture might. And uh, th so that was my approach. My approach was get into the home and then you could design the home itself but uh, I've gotten so, so into to furniture. I mean, I've loosely dabbled back into architecture, but it's been mostly furniture. And, uh, you know, what I like about that is, you know, you're building a table in a matter of weeks instead of years. So for me to, to see my vision in reality um, so quickly is, it keeps me interested and really intrigued by the process. But the building of the, of the piece are you saying is on average two weeks physical building yes yeah and, and how 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 long is it is it in your consciousness uh before Mo uh, months are, are you are you doing experimental stuff as 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 the people that work for you uh implement well, yeah so you know you start with no portfolio and you say i want to build you a table and they're like well what kind of table and well, then you have to convince them that it's something you're capable of doing, first of all, and that something something that's worth doing, second of all. So right. you have to be able to convey uh, an idea. And in my case, I would use hand sketches and in some cases, uh, 3D models to do that. Because um, clients oftentimes can't see things, you know, visually without more or less um, seeing it in, on paper as a three-dimensional model. How many of your clients now, Taylor, are repeat customers and giving you carte blanche? I have, I have one repeat customer who I would say is keeping me busy about 60% of the time, okay. maybe 70%. 70 um, and, and how much design are you spending with him or does he just say- The well, same as any other customer. Same as any other. Did you find him easier? I, I find him to be like the classic patron of the arts. Oh. Um, he is the ideal client. He pretty much lets me do whatever I want within reason. And obviously it has to be good. So give I, him or do you give him more than he paid for? I give everyone, I think, more. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially early on. I mean, I look back, you know, I would finish a project and be like, holy shit they got totally hooked up on this one, you know, cause, cause I don't care what, what the dollar amount is at the end of the day. My, my biggest interest is what's that? Was probably you getting hooked up with the piece. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just want to be interested in what I'm doing. And I think, um, if I'm interested, the work is better. So Absolutely. I won't take on a project that, that necessarily pays more if I'm not interested in it. But if it pays less and I'm really interested in it, you know, I might be willing to do that. And that's often how I built sort of the portfolio that I have now. Um, well, there's always more value than the piece itself. In fact, today I would almost say the piece is the least valuable. The experience, uh, sharing your work, or, or even these live videos is where the real value can sometimes be, right? Uh, for prospective clients or to just have learned uh, to do. how much of your pieces um, inspire the next? Well, I, hold on. I just want to say one other thing is like when I finish a piece, 
And I'm, you know, we've spent t at least two weeks kind of grueling over every little detail and all the shit that happens. Like if we flatten a slab and then it starts twisting or something. Right. And we're, you know, painstakingly chasing five thousandths of an inch in, in every dimension. Um, I really kind of form a hatred with the piece. And it's kind of this turmoil. I don't know if yin yang is the right term for it, but I, I can't really appreciate a piece of mine until um, the day that we do a photo shoot of it or, or the day after we finish it and assemble it and set it up. It's like that one moment where I'm like, oh, this is good, you know? And so it, oftentimes it, it's like, it's it, it, uh, good, but it could have been so much better and no one will ever know that, but um so how big's your crew uh there's six of us in here okay and they're all uh they're all orchestrated under your direction or any yeah. of them self-directed mm, no okay so um how hard was that to get a team together that could work with your vision and I'm assuming they're happy to work there and probably quite um, humbled the fact that they're doing these magnificent pieces. Are they architecturally trained people or are they craftspeople or are they just, how do you, how do you speak to your help? I've, I've hired, I, I started by hiring anyone I could get to help me. Um, sometimes that was uh, architectural graduates from, okay. from the same school. Um, sometimes it was, you know, a kid who I met in an alley, uh, at my, where my shop was, who happened to, to express some interest or I saw some potential, okay. but, but the, the previous experience doesn't really matter to me. Um, it's more, and, and to your point, the hardest part was building a team and is building a team and maintaining the team and yeah keeping them interested because obviously you could make more elsewhere we we sometimes lose money because of how um perf how much of a perfectionist i am or or the details or you know sometimes we see an opportunity that wasn't even part of the initial piece that i i begin oh, to that's so totally me i don't uh, i don't know if the listeners can understand what that really means well it, you know, you're, you're doing a piece in two weeks, but you're, as you said, sounds like you've already designed it. Now the team's taking it over. You're probably on to other things. Like, well, yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, I, I could come up with a blueprint, right? And we'll come up with working drawings and then we'll um, pick out the wood and then we'll start planing it or joining it. Right. And, and um, the inch and three quarter piece that I had expected turned out to be, you know, a 64th under that. And now all the drawings have to get redone or we have to, to redesign it. And then in the case of this bed that we just did in doing so, I say, you know, oh, we just have to adjust it in this dimension. And then we realize later on that that impacted another component. And now we have to go about redesigning the whole piece while making it look exactly how it did before. So now we have to start, um, you know, routing uh, parts into parts and nesting yeah. them to 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 reclaim that amount that we lost. I mean, it's it's just um, that's the struggle. That's the part was the struggle part. Yeah, I mean, and it I, I, happens. I, I, it happens I, I, every time. Hey. It happens every time and multiple times. But I think it's fair to say, Taylor, you're working with things. To a six to to five thousand, you say, and this is huge slabs or chunks of wood that you'd breathe on would move that much. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's almost as if you revel in the challenge of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy the challenge. I particularly grew up um, to some degree when people said you couldn't do something. I became more interested in it. Yes. Uh, I think breaking the rules is probably the only way to innovate. And, uh, you know, I, I like to, you know, after watching a, 
a chef's table episode. I don't know how many people have seen that show, but on season two, episode one, they interviewed this chef of a Chicago restaurant yeah. who really questioned every aspect of everything. Why do we eat with forks? Why do we use yeah. tablecloths? Why do we, you know, this and that. And, and when I, when I viewed that sort of logic through the, the rules of woodworking that a table has to be flat, that, you know, a, a finish has to be bulletproof. Right. That yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, all that stuff. Does the table have to be flat? Um, I actually ate at a restaurant, nonetheless, that was made out of like uh, half inch strips or quarter inch strips, and they were all kind of doing this. And I put a cup there and I was like, holy shit, it works. You know, is it ideal? Well, Maybe not, but. To not take for granted what they think something is. Um, for instance, a simple question would be, Taylor, what is a table? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, in Japan, it's very low. If it's a court table, it's very high. Those positions, those just height. Height, yeah. It, it, they're both tables, but one is about reverence, the other is about order. And I, I see in your work, you take a real conscious decision about, as you said, why, wh that's not important that the finish is bulletproof. That's not the point. How much of you questioning everything is, is uh, causing it to be a chaotic build? Is it hmm. exploring just as much of that as you can? Well, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to extract every single... Um... Sorry to cueing someone else out. Um, I think agonizing over those details is... Is the point. Is it the point? Well, going back, first of all, when you mentioned Japan, it made me think, you know, was it was it going to Asia that started that sort of redirection of like is 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 the American way the only way? Like I remember when we went to Kyoto, we were sleeping on the floor on these cots with a pillow, and I was like, I've always wanted to try this. And day one, I was like, this fucking sucks. I slept maybe three hours last night. <laughs> day four or five, I was like, this is amazing. It's like no no problem. And it made me question, like, does a bed have to be cushiony? Does it have to be soft? Does it have to be raised? How tall does a bed have to be? You know, like when I go to my parents' house, they have this one bed that's like four feet off the ground. And I just like curse it every time I climb into it. Um, so the, so I questioned all these things too. And I went back in history to see. And so I asked myself what a table is and, and started looking at tables with that view as opposed to, oh, the table. No. I mean, it, it's one of those things that the average person would go, what do you mean, what is it? Don't you know what a table is? No, you, I don't think you do. And I think, I think once you do start to question those things, you, you, you go back in the past. And I know beds were really high back in the day because that's the way the houses were. They used to have curtains around the bed so that you would actually be warm and cozy. Oh, wow. Huh. You know, like if you've ever watched Oliver Twist and, and those, you'll see the old Victorian beds were very high and usually had curtains around them. So you could close that all in. Funny you say that because the bed that I'm talking about, my mom bought in an auction and it's probably 150 years old. So, but, yeah, that's interesting. You know, but then, then, you know, we really are, most of us, unless, as I said, if you're not trained to look and, and, and had um, the arts as an academic study, you, you can't really be critical of too many things. It opens up, uh, it, it opens up a desire for really, really good work. And I think that's what you're trying to say about the agonization of getting that good work out. Okay, so, so let's also point out the fact that we're dealing you know, I'm fortunate enough to deal with some really beautiful pieces of wood. And yeah. it's not because, you know, I just happen to come, I actually agonize about finding the perfect piece for every single client of mine. Can so, you, I mean, 
talk about all the materials you use because I find them all to be rich. That I would call yeah, but rich. but in particular in regards to finishing a table, right? Like, why do most woodworkers think a bulletproof finish, even clients, why do they think a bulletproof finish is required, right? It's it's it's, it's have, to protect the surface so that's easier. Sandwich. Huh? It's because they have children who eat jam sandwich and they're very practical. And I say, get your kids away from that thing. Bullshit. I have a two-year-old. I have a two-year-old who fucks up my table, my coffee table every day. I Are take you, a, I take a wet rag and I clean it, and it looks as good as it did the day before. And, and I think that, that that living distresses on. Like, I mean, I'd rather a distressed piece than distressed varnish or catalyzed lacquer. I'd well, yeah, because that never looks good. Grape stain, grape juice stain, or, or, or something like that, to, to at least make the wood feel like it's wood. Some of, the, some of the finishes, these bulletproof ones, make it look like plastic. Yeah, and, and ultimately, do you want to take a gorgeous wood table? Yeah. A wood table, not a plastic table, yeah. and put a plastic finish over it? No. I would rather show that I love this piece of wood so much that I'm going to sand it well beyond what most people would do, well beyond what the books tell you that even manufacturer, the finish that I used to use, told me to do, and, and make it feel so good to the touch that you want to touch the wood not the finish. So, so that to me was, was why I, you know, questioned finishing and eventually came to that. So, I mean, beyond that, I love to experiment with different materials like bronze or granite and one of the, or glass even and, and inlaying that into the table because it oftentimes can create an experience for the user and experience is more or less what I'm ultimately chasing more than anything. It's not a beautiful object. It's an object that you sit at and experience whatever you're doing at it differently because you're either becoming so entranced. Not so much the function, although the majority of your pieces I would call perfectly functional. Um, yes, I mean, I won't make a, a table that doesn't function as a table. Okay. Uh, to a certain I, point, you'll, you'll put in some things that in fact, a lot of the times the, the inlays that I do are to make more functionality of a piece rather than to make more beauty necessarily. I mean, in making more functionality, I'll make sure that the proportions of the piece or the shape of it, you know, adds beauty to it and doesn't take away. Um, and that goes from the top as well as the base. You know, the base can't take away from the top of the table. Uh, it can't pull your attention away from the top of the table because it's so beautiful and also because it's so right. ugly. It can't do it in either way. It has to find some sort of balance in that, in that sort of realm. But, you know, I like the idea of, of you thinking or a client thinking that a, a wood table is all wood and then their hand grazes over the granite or the glass or the bronze. And they're like, wait a second, what is that? You know, and that's happened several times at trade shows a client will like put their hands over the, the table and, and kind of go like that. And it'll be cold because wood is inherently warm and, and metal and, and yeah. granite and stone are not. So I love that element of surprise and, and sort of experience that a table can offer. Now, and, and really any piece. Now, everything you've described there are natural. I would even call it glass natural, granite. Uh, even your casting bronzes. How, how do you feel about synthetics? Uh, plastic. I, I hate it. Okay. It's like the worst, the worst fucking thing in the world. I watched, you know, and I go down this rabbit hole a little bit, but I watched a film called Plastic Planet okay. and how essentially we're covering our world with this stuff called microplastic. Yeah. In yeah. other words, that plastic is getting into everything, including our food, and it's like yeah. a fucking nightmare. Yeah. And when I see people pouring, you know, a, a beautiful slab with, with plastic or in that case, resin or epoxy or eco epoxy, whatever you want to call it, it's still the same plastic and uh, it's borderline a tragedy. So I, it's like, 
kind of the worst thing in the world for me, especially when you're taking a, a natural material and you're kind of bastardiz bastardizing it. And, and I don't think they're doing it intentionally in the sense that they're trying to make a statement about the natural and the unnatural. They're actually just like, oh, this just makes, you know, fills in the table and whatnot. I, I, I personally think it's good to have principles and I think that's what you have. Okay. Um, I Not even just principles, but, but you have to have a, um, uh, a basis for your opinion. You can't just have an opinion. You have to have a reason for having the opinion. You have to, have a you have to let that ring true through everything that you do. Um, like say, you know, you recycle at home, it's, but you just poured your 10th epoxy table. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? First of all, the epoxy right. is gonna, gonna break apart from the wood at some point, and it's gonna end up in the trash can. And it, I don't know, it just get, it pisses me off, but I don't wanna go. Well, I, I, could, I could probably beat that to, um, it's very trendy. And so the clients are pushing um, a lot of the, the craftspeople and artisans to actually do that type of work. And I mean, that's the problem with trends, right? And I've been through a number of trends. Um, I, I do believe that your work um, can get ruined by trend because nobody recognizes the difference between yours or somebody else's work. And I think it's important to describe and educate people to what the difference is. And I think in your work, the difference is, is that it's, they're all natural materials. Uh, mm. Uh, they also exhibit a bit of craftsmanship in executing their marriage to the piece, whereas pouring epoxy, um, you know, I guess there's some skills to that, but it's not necessarily hand skills, fitting and joining and engineering and, 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 and all those things. So, I mean, you... No doubt, no doubt pouring epoxy is something that I can't do, like, I, and I have no desire to, so I probably could figure it out. But, um, you know, getting it completely bubble free, like, there's all these skills involved with that. But at the end of the day, like you're saying, it is more or less a butt joint, and there's no joinery shown in it. I mean, one thing that could be interesting, and maybe someone should try this if they're going to insist on pouring epoxy, is to do half of a butterfly on, on a portion of the table pour the epoxy into that um, more or less mortise and fill it and create a, a joint out of the epoxy to the, I mean, that, that could actually be interesting, but. Um, but because it's synthetic and in your opinion, doesn't have the integrity to hold up over time, those, that's well, just. Well, and it, it yellows over time. It just doesn't look good. Over, like people don't think of longevity when they make things, they're just like, I want it to look good right now. Like when I finish a table, yeah, it should look perfect when I finish it, but it should look just as good 20 years from now. And part of the way you do that is by using solid woods um, or in, you know, I know you're, you're a fan of using stave core uh, in some of the doors you do. And, and that ultimately leads to stability, which ultimately leads to a better product in many years from today. Or, and, you know, using thicker veneers and shop-made veneers over... Um, That's you know. the only veneer work I do, which I call honest veneer work. Yes. Um, you know, this we're not gluing paper-thin veneers you can see light through over particle board or MDF. Um, and um, and Stavecor has a good tradition. So, uh, in fact, the Parliament Building's here in Ottawa, which is uh, English architecture from 1860. There's doors, there, those doors are, are stave core doors. So I still call that solid wood. It, 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 it's just engineered solidly. Like our, my veneer is <laughs> 3 sixteenths at thinnest. Right. So it, it can, uh, it, in all intents and purposes, behave like solid wood. My but anyways, going, going back to what you were saying about... <laughs> I don't have the wood you got. And that for me is the reason, the biggest reason for Stavecore. And, and the brutality of 
exterior doors having to hold up to minus 30 outside. Right, right, right. Like, like things move. And um, so I, you know, I don't want people throwing out doors because, and I do the sort of the same thing, Taylor. I'm putting big wide kickers 20 inches wide, which all the books are going to tell you is split right down the middle, right? So I revel in that same idea of you of, of saying, well, no, you have to respect the material and you can respect it at that width or that dimension. And you're willing to risk that it will crack and you right. don't stand behind it if it does, which I'm pretty sure you would. would, would. I've, I've flown out to um, clients' houses where, you know, I started doing kind of going back to what you're saying about innovating, right? I, I made these glass and wood tables and I did them perfectly. And I had a client in Montana who had his table in his house that he was in maybe uh, three weeks out of the year. And um, the wood moved and the glass uh, chipped as a result. And, you know, he had a house in New York where um, the same thing happened. He ordered the tables back to back, essentially. Okay. So I didn't have chance to sort of innovate the design enough in order to make it, um, res you know, respond to those conditions. His uh, ceiling was uh, glass in his New York apartment. As you can imagine, you know, when it gets cold in New York, you crank up the heat. Right. When it gets hot, you crank up the AC. So the humidity is probably swinging up and down. It's getting direct sunlight. His Montana yeah. house is, you know, going from probably, I don't know, 20 degrees to uh, 90, whatever, whenever he's there. Uh, humidity is interior humidity in any of the heated areas. Like you're in LA, so you've got a pretty constant temperature. But here, for instance, um, humidity levels in February can go down to 5%. And in humid and 30, you know? So the only thing I got yeah. to watch is that we kick off uh, in an hour. Have you got a timer on? Anybody uh, watch and tell? Third, we're at 37 on? minutes. Okay. You can see that? Yeah. Okay. Rem remind me when we're close to an hour to kick off. Otherwise, uh, IG won't save it might toss us off and i want to got save it. this conversation got it so so how am i kind of going back, going back hold on i want to i want to talk about one thing real quick yeah. you know we talk about innovation right and um okay. like one thing i think of is is modern art right is is oftentimes we'll go to a museum and you'll hear someone say this i could have done that right like my kid could have done yeah. that and what people don't realize is it's not about what they did. It's about what they did in response to what was done or in response to what was done before them. Um, so uh, one, one easy example and way to think of this is. You, you have to be educated in the arts. Well, no, let's not even talk about art, right? Let's, let's talk about the most basic and probably one of the biggest uh, innovations like the wheel, right? Pre-wheel. <laughs> Maybe people were using squares or whatever. But when the wheel came yeah. around, it's like, oh, it's so obvious. Why don't we just make it round? I, it's so obvious. I, that's a good I can do that. I can make it round. It's like, well, you didn't do that. It was that guy who did it, whoever it was or girl or thing. And, and that is innovation. So that's what people need to realize. It's, it's, it's not that that they did something that was so fundamentally difficult and skillful. It's that they thought if I just tweak this, this four sided shape into a thousand sided shape or even octagon would even be an improvement over a square, you know, you created something fundamentally new in, in human history, if not, maybe not the world, but in human history. And that is, totally respectable and and as you evolve or go through that's history, not that's not a common thing Taylor. no i mean and and to do that now when we've been around for however many years we've been around it's so much more difficult i mean where where maybe you take like a 180 sided object and make it 190 it's significant i mean it's it's 
it's new. It's not maybe drastically different, but the, the the other side of that the other side of that coin is is that people um, can also be infatuated with the idea of being unique for its own sake, which can lead to fallies too. I mean, there's lots of art that's not finished um, that got sort of buried because of innovation. Mm. Okay, uh, the trends coming in, and and you know, I think I think the people that are leading in the way that you're saying, leading the ideas and the the technology. Uh, I've always said that what really makes the world go around are artists. It, the artists create, and then the entrepreneurs come in and capitalize on it. But without the artists, who don't make any money. Mm. The entrepreneurs would have real, really nothing. We, we create the desire by coming up, as you say, with unique innovations over uh, the comparison of before. I mean, I'm talking successful artists as yourself. <coughs> and so I can see what you, what you mean by that. Can, can, you, can you, though, seriously say that that's what you're doing? Um, consciously or or is it just something because of your nature happens yeah more or less I, what you just said I mean I'm not I'm not trying to be groundbreaking I'm just trying to do things that I find interesting yes and oftentimes if I if I haven't seen it done before it it, it comes to me to figure out how to do it so um, you know, like, for example, one of the one of the early pieces where I, I quote unquote innovated was um, attaching a cast bronze edge onto a, a table seamlessly. And I'd never seen oh, anyone that, do that. That was lovely. How how do you feel about copying? I think I think too many people take things for granted, like. Like when you innovate, you you fail a thousand times, more or less, right? So you're in new territory. You're in new territory, and like, you know, in terms of that table that I shipped to Montana and New York, I didn't know it failed until months after I made it, and it wasn't catastrophic. It was a minor failure, but a failure nonetheless. And unfortunately, it was out of my shop at the time, so I had to fly back and deal with it. Do you adjust for the lessons learned in that way? Yeah, I mean, like in the case of, of that particular piece, um, the fit is no longer a glove. It, it has more or less a 16th of play. And the corsets that I make are slotted instead of uh, drilled with a hole so that, you know, it still looks like the original, but if the glass starts to push out, it can actually push the end of the rod of the corset uh, to accommodate the wood movement. They're just, fric they're just friction fit now? No, they're still pinned, um, but the pin is now in a slot. Oh, okay. Okay. So you, you and you can't see that. It looks exactly the same. And that's what innovation can be, too. It could look the same. And what people tend to do is they copy it without understanding how it actually works. I would agree and with that, you. And that cheapens, cheapens what I've done or what other people have done, too, because, you know, their copies will fail in ways that, you know, someone who actually understood why they did why I'm talking to you, Taylor, this is, these are the important things. Uh, the integrity of the pieces. It, it, what looks like something on the outside is generally not. How do you feel about hidden joinery or exposed joinery? It, 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 I think hidden, hidden joinery is, is the same as exposed joinery. Um, from a crafts perspective, you're you're doing the joint because you want to do the joint. You don't give a shit if it's visible or not. Engineering features or are they artistic expression? Well, a hidden a hidden joint is is both, right? Like if if you can hide an art a structural or artistic expression, you're carrying the logic of the overall piece into the detail of the piece, and this goes to what I was saying to you earlier, it's not the, the phrase, it's all in the details, often gets 
gets repeated without understanding what, what details really are or what they really mean. It's not about, oh, look at this, this little piece of my table this big. Yeah. That's a detail. Yeah, I mean, that's a small piece of your piece, which in fact is a detail, but, but why is that important? Like, is it, it as it, important? They'll relate to the whole. Yes, or I mean, so if you want to make a beautiful piece and I flip it over and I see on the bottom side that you didn't bother sanding it to the same level or, or you attached it with lag screws instead of maybe yeah. brass bolts when you have brass all over and bronze on the top, and they're exposed, I mean, like it kind of cheapens it. Now a client will never know that and, and probably would never care, but it really comes down and, and maybe where I learned this was when I used to do karate and my sensei would be, you know, teaching a class of 30 and you're tired as shit and he wants you to do the same kick, you know, 50 times. Yeah. Yeah. And you know he's not looking and you kind of do a half kick and a half kick and a quarter kick and then he turns around and sees you and you go straight back up. But it's the discipline of, you know, whether or not you're looking, I'm still going to do it. It's, it's a respect to yourself, to your work, to the piece, to the client. Um, I don't know how I would describe that, but it is something I do as well. Um, I always tell my clients that oh, I don't care if you don't got the money, I'm not cutting corners. Like, like, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it, I build it to a certain level and th th there's no, I don't have levels of quality. It's quality. There's no levels of quality. Yeah. I, I mean, my client sometimes says, can't you do it faster? And it's like, I'm yeah. sorry, we kind of only have one speed. I tried, I used to try building uh, crates for all of our pieces and like, you would laugh like a crate that takes a crating company, you know, three hours took us two days and it looked like shit. And it's because I was obsessing about everything. And yeah. So what would you, what would you say your scale of work is? Uh, what I mean is, you know, some people can um, build houses and some can build big houses in furniture some of your pieces are quite big so I, I think it's easier for a client to spend money on a large square footage of space in their home than yeah. a small square footage um like a you know and i'm just throwing out a number here but like a five hundred thousand dollar table versus five thousand five hundred thousand dollar uh letter opener it's a little easier right. to swallow the table right, right? um right so I think it's it's important for my clients to say like this table is taking up X amount of square foot and therefore I can justify spending a little more on that. So, uh, but you know, we do pieces that are tiny and yeah, sometimes they take as long as a table that's that's seven feet long and, or, you know, some, or a seven foot table takes almost as Which, much as a 14 foot table. You enjoy both the scales equally? I think the bigger the piece, you know, the bigger the piece of wood that I get to use, the bigger the expression of an idea, the more impact that it has on a space or on someone sitting at it. Like a, you look at a, um, here, let me just take you here real quick. You look at a, uh, you look at a little box like this, right? Yeah. It, it has three pieces of wood, one, two, three. It, it's still beautiful. And, you know, this this took us far longer than we should have spent on it. But, but when you look at a slab, let's flip that. And you could see the entire, um, sort of lifespan of this tree. That's a magnificent piece. Yeah, I mean, it tells so much of a story and it's 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 fun for us to be able to to look at these beautiful pieces and it inspires us to do better and you know even a piece like this. Yeah, so this is this is what you call your corset table. Right. Yeah, I the things I love about what you do is you 
don't do book matches. You, you um, select the grain and shift or do whatever you do for the grain of each board to play off itself in what I would call a much more dramatic way than any book match would ever do. Yeah, I mean, book matches are nice, but you're really drawing yourself to the... Um... Center line. Yeah, to what you did to the wood, right? Like, right. I, I want you to appreciate the wood and then appreciate what we did to it. You know, not not the other way around. Like, even here, you know, the glass is kind of an interesting material because it reflects the environment and therefore gets cam camouflaged by it. And the wood really gets to uh, uh, <laughs> the last dance. Here you get to uh, you get to experience the wood, and then you kind of notice how the glass kind of plays with it. And then you know on further That's inspection, what I, I mean the wood the wood's gorgeous. There's no question about it. But for me, the glass, what you've done with the glass, uh, reads the geometry. So it's saying, look, here's the geometry of the table by the by the extent of the glass edges. It it it's squaring it up, but you you also interrupt it by saying, oh well, that's also the connection between two pieces of wood, and so I mean, you you really play that up, Taylor, and I think it's magnificent. But even well, you know what it started with, Jack is like I couldn't afford I couldn't afford these tables. For my clients because oh, i wasn't charging okay. them enough that's fantastic right so i picked out the pieces of wood that nobody wanted wanted to sell like you know my lumber yards awesome i dug through their trash and they're like oh you want that one like <laughs> huh and you know they started out really cheap and then they are like holy shit, this guy's making amazing pieces with them we need to charge more for those yeah now. and it's kind of funny how like and George Nakashima did the same thing. Yeah. Um, he he yeah. used the sapwood, which furniture makers at the time were like, oh, you know, that's the weak wood in the table, or that's so contrasty, it takes away from my design. And he was like, I want that. Don't throw that away. They used to cut yeah. that off and, and burn it or chip it or whatever they did. So, like, I – and by the way, you know, working with fucked up pieces of wood is so much more work. Um oh. Totally. Whether whether it's figuring out how to make this, which used to be a giant hole, somewhat attractive and somewhat functional, or even, you know, like picking through it, we had to apply some rot fix on there in order to make it sound just so much more work um, to make an ugly duck. Yeah, sorry, IG kicked us off. We'll we'll do round two here. Uh, just gonna wait for Taylor to come back on. Uh, wow, was just right into the depth of it. Sorry for that, guys. New technology doesn't hold up that well. Hi, right, guys. And yeah, just waiting for Taylor. Uh, let's see here. I'll see if he's on yet. No. Yeah, so IG kicked us off. Uh, I'm on the second one here, so we'll uh, just waiting for Taylor again to come back. Hope you're enjoying it. Okay, Taylor, hope you figured it out. Join back up. Ah, no, he's not on. He should be coming back soon. Don't know, maybe there was something happened on his end. I don't know. Just waiting for it. Yeah, it was getting good. It was getting fantastically good. Yeah. Oh, I'm enjoying it. No reason to thank me. Um, I've admired Taylor's work uh, ever since I saw it. 
Hi, Wendy. Uh, well, I'm glad uh, it seemed like we had a good crowd of people watching. Unfortunate thing is I wasn't able to save that portion of the video because it kicked us off. Uh, no, I was unable to save the first part, so we might sort of go over a few of the other things. That was a great video. Hi, sweetie. Yeah, uh, just waiting for Taylor to sign back in so I can add him. I'm not sure if it was his phone or what, but we hadn't gone to an hour. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about some stuff. I'm upset we weren't able to save that part of the video. But me and Taylor talked about actually us having conversations on our feeds about design and uh, the this, this, this sort of reasons for that. So we might, we will probably do this again on our own feeds, either Taylor's or mine, discussing uh, uh, what's important. Yeah, thanks, sweetie. What was he saying about finish? He was saying it should be natural and that it shouldn't be synthetic and it shouldn't be bulletproof. That it should express um, the natures of the wood and not, not make wood what it isn't. Ah, glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, his table with the glass is called the corset table. It, it's derived from the brass butterfly, well, I call them butterflies because that's the traditional connection. They are mechanical connections, a bit of metalwork involved, as he, as he was saying, stuff that um, you can't see, but there's integrity behind. So when you copy it, make sure you understand what it's actually doing. Anyway, we're still waiting for him to join. I'm not sure what happened. He might even be talking and be unaware that we're, we lost the video. Yes, he's coming back. Uh, although, uh, hey, Matt, uh, I'm just waiting for him to join or at least figure out what went wrong. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm upset that we didn't get to... Uh, save that video but as i said i think we'll uh we'll me and me and taylor will do our own uh hey matt what do you think of the interview so far buddy Hey, yeah, how you doing over at Furniture? Still waiting for Taylor. Uh, maybe something happened to his phone. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, you're only getting on just now, Matt? Yeah. Uh, so someone wants me to tell me a bit more about my work. Uh, well, I started off in furniture and moved into... Uh, um, yeah, we're waiting for Taylor. Ah, here he is. Okay, so... Uh, Uh, he was unable to join. We'll try to add him. Request again, Taylor. Taylor, request to be on again.
Mr. Taylor is trying to get on here. Maybe there was technical difficulty on his side. Oh, you can't watch unless you're on the phone, eh? Not on the screen. I never thought of that. That's interesting, Matt. You trying? Okay, hold on. Let me try. Uh, that might work. Ah. Uh, I'm back. So the bad news is, is we lost that awesome fucking section there. Oh, the whole thing? Yeah, we're going to have to do it live on ours whenever, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was totally fucking awesome. So get Can we just right repeat everything? Back, get right back to that table. Okay. <clears throat> you want to so, see what we're working on for my mother-in-law? So a lot... It, uh, this is, look this is for my mother-in-law. A lot of the questions were kind of upset about what you were talking about in finishes and stuff. What what type of finishes are you using, Taylor? Um, so I started with uh, Sam Maloof's finish because he's my hero, and then okay, so uh, I know. Yeah, I used his poly oil, not so much the wax, but. Um, I uh, I then ventured into Osmo, which was pretty rarely used at the time. And then uh, uh, I decided at some point that I should just start making my own finish because I wanted something that didn't smell so bad as the Osmo, which is still low VOC, but nonetheless. Um, and so, what, have you, what have you ended up with? I'll show you. Here's my little finishing cabinet. Got about, I don't know, six or seven types of waxes. Okay. Mix them with uh, citrus solvent and uh, hemp seed oil with uh, sunflower oil and jojoba oil and a few others. I don't really know what I'm doing, but it, it works out pretty well. It's not really well, rocket it's, science it's at the end of the day. It's a high wax. It's a high wax then is what we you would describe yeah, it. I have, I have a jar of it. I'll show you what it looks like. I mean, here's here's what it more or less finishes like. More, it looks like, just, like it looks like tongue oil. Yeah, it's it's kind of the same same thing. Um, how, how, oh, so it's quite pasty, eh? Well, I make it with different viscosities. This one's fairly thin, uh, and there's not a ton left, but. Um, yeah, Odie's oil kind of intrigued me, but I looked at the ingredients, and that's kind of why I decided to just make it myself. Well, this must have uh, a cure time that's a little longer, too, eh? Yeah, I would say so. Probably like a week or something, but I don't know. Osmo's cure time was 24 hours, supposedly. I found it to be closer to three or four days. Right, before you could handle big pieces without... Yeah, yeah. Marks? Yeah. Is it an in the wood or on the wood finish? Uh, both. The oil goes in, the wax goes on, and then the solvent helps the, the wax go a little bit in is my guess. But again, I'm not a chemist or anything like that. I did a ton of research on it. Um, it's 100% yes. organic. And then I, I thought I was good by using 100% organic. And then when I started boiling all the stuff together, I, I got pretty high. And I realized that um, citrus solvent, which is the main solvent in it, uh, basically has one of the highest VOCs out of all the solvents. Oh, Higher even, than turpentine. What's that? Even though it's natural. Yes. Well, so someone's asking, why don't you use Odie's? I don't dislike Odie's. I've just never tried it, and I don't. I don't have a reason. I, I gotta to... admit, I'm curious to see what it's like. One of the uh, my 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 old shopmate tried it and um, he liked it a lot, but it was very uh, very hard to apply, very thick, and um, you know, it's it, finishing just doesn't have to be a product that you buy off the shelf. It's Sam Maloof made his own finish. I was like, why don't I just do that? Yeah. Uh, oh, at I the do. end of the day, oil and wax are all you really need, and do it all the time. Yeah. Now, I'll 
I'm maybe not making it as organic as you, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's the same thing. So I'll, I'll do colored waxes a lot. I'll give colored waxes to my client to maintain their furniture. Uh, uh, but I, at, at waxes. But I generally don't like my clients to do it because they don't know what they're doing. Right. That uh, instead, I'll I just hey, look. If you have any problems with your finish, just call me. I'll come. The it nice thing about about a natural finish that you could apply barehanded is that you know your clients can apply it without worrying about them yes. being toxic yes. stuff all over themselves and and stinking up their whole house and whatnot. So, if a client yes. wants to refinish their table because they're a little anal about it, I'll just ship them some finish and call it a day. And uh, they're perfectly fine using a natural oil wax product. So when you say you have different viscosities, are you thinning that with the solvent or, or more oil? Um, I use both. Uh, I use about 50% solvent in any of the finishes just to help the cure time a little bit. And then yeah. I use uh, uh, varying levels of oil to wax ratios to get um, to get better uh, uh, thinness or thickness or whatever the case may be. Have you had any trouble with um, anything going rancid? No. Um, and I, I always am scared of that. So like, you know, there are dry, dry oils and wet oils I found out. Um, the oils that I use, I try to use all the dry oils, but I started using jojoba oil, which had questionably a uh, wet oil what tendency. Is or, jojoba what is, is a, uh, it's a, I believe it's a grain found somewhere in Africa or somewhere like that. And yeah. they press it into an oil and it has great lubrication properties. Um, let's see, let's see what it is. But, but what is the general market? Uh, hair and skin. Like, they use it for massaging a lot. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my finishes, you can probably lather all over your body. Uh, I wouldn't do it necessarily with the uh, citrus solvent, but if you omit yeah. that, then you're pretty good. Love it, man. I love it. I love, yeah. I love the sheen of it. Yeah. You don't want, in my opinion, a high gloss. Most of my clients. I hate high gloss. A lot of people love them, but um, well, they I aren't think it's just because they've seen them that way before. Like, why are high gloss finishes in existence? And in my opinion, in traditional furniture, it was to protect the veneers, um, which was largely almost all that was used. So uh, someone asked if these are for sale. I mean, sort of not really a, this is sold. That one is sold. This one is for sale. And this one in back is for sale as well, but also not finished. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I see it, you know, like you see them on yachts and things like that. It's so gaudy. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and if you're using veneer, you have to use it. So to me, oil wax is luxurious because not only are you feeling the wood, but you're also saying this is solid wood. And solid wood is luxurious. So um, that's how I feel about that. Sort of a sort of a Nakashima's why he uses solid wood. Well, he describes in his book about why he uses solid oh, wood. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> he, he calls it honest. Uh, hmm. It's honest. <laughs> uh, I was I was surprised. There's a local uh, veneer mill called GL Veneer where I used to buy a lot of my slabs before we kind of got this whole collection here. Right. Um, I'll flip it over just so we can check it out. But um, they uh, they showed me a, a a log sliced into veneer, and I was really taken aback at how useful or, or efficient it is to use veneers in that way where you could get maybe um 3000 sheets instead of uh yeah. 300 or 30 boards you know yes it made me feel almost wasteful and then i started to realize well yeah but how long does that veneer last 
and maybe what what is that veneer actually useful for like i think most people would use that in in wall paneling and things like that well that's why that's where i think veneer is dishonest it, it it's it, it's well, dishonest. and and you reference nakashima and it's it's soulless um what makes solid wood beautiful right it's look at this you know what makes it so beautiful well yeah there may be termite damage and there may be holes well, and checks in this board and, but you could see that that's that's a that's a thick board right there that's and that depth is what adds to the interest of of the piece yeah. it's not just a single yeah. plane of whatever a single sheet it has depth and therefore it has some some soul to it and i think maybe what attracted you to the lower grades so to speak yeah i mean they were just interesting right like because veneer veneer grade is pretty boring looking stuff it might have Port cortison material is so boring yet so stable it's like a i wish i wish a flat sawn well it, 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 be a, it becomes a statement of its figure but i mean, I mean there are practical and um, and I mean, good work can obviously be veneer work. And obviously, as you say, slicing all those sheets allows the scale of the work to be scaled. In other words, if I want an entire executive suite to be clad in, in a single grain, there's no other way to do that. The scale of even the largest trees can only big, build so much in solid. Right. Uh, are you still cutting that huge, massive tree? That uh, yeah, we're actually. I'm actually planning to fly up in about a week or so uh, to um, to go over the milling and direct the sawmill on where where and how to cut everything. Is but, it uh, standing as a a, a, a a limbless trunk? No, no, it's already it's already all shipped up there. It's been uh, anchor sealed. Um, just waiting for its moment. What What are your plans for that tree? I'm planning to slab all of all of the pieces over uh, probably 30 inches, and then uh, make lumber out of the rest, all the limbs and things like that. Just dimensional lumber. Yes. Yeah. And and there may be some opportunities to do sculptural pieces out of interesting shapes that would maybe not lend themselves to lumber or slabs or anything like that. And is, it, is that a way to recover costs for harvesting such a thing? N costs is sure, but it's, it's more about utilizing every piece of the, the tree. Um, it was a gorgeous tree. It was huge. It was beautifully grained. So, I mean, Oh, it must be nothing, nothing, should should ever go to waste with a tree and in this case it definitely will not so next door i actually have a remnant of about 20 percent of the first tree that we milled which was um slightly larger than the one i posted recently and uh, tell, tell us how big when you say large um the one next door is a 10 foot diameter that's massive massive and uh, it was about 12 feet long so there was only one sawmill that I knew of on the West Coast that was able to mill it properly. And that was um, a fellow named Evan Shively up in uh, Petaluma. Okay. He had a custom mill built with a huge hydraulic crane. It had a <clears throat> just over 10 foot capacity. And we uh, cut the, he slabbed, no, he chainsawed the tree in half while it okay. was laying in his yard. And then uh, each piece we threw on the mill and started slicing it into slabs that way. Um, luckily, only hitting metal one or two times. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, we, we paid, someone asked how much it would cost. It, it was, uh, you know, we paid probably triple what a normal, beautiful walnut tree would cost. So to give you some idea yeah. about saying everything. Oh, these trees grow on trees like that that's a that's a big tree yeah, yeah yeah it was i and you know we took the time to make sure that we could get massive slabs you know and that 
that came down to going to the right person to saw it, who understood yes. the value of it and also appreciated what we were trying to do. So he, we were able to get three 10 foot wide by 12 foot long slabs. That's incredible. That, yeah. And uh, retained ownership of all of those. And then so, well, how the, thick sliced those 10 foot slabs? Um, between three and a half to four inches. Okay. And was that a good choice? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have done any thicker. I wouldn't have done any thinner. It's so tricky sawing slabs that thick because, or that wide, because, um, you know, you can't use a bandsaw mill, which would be the most efficient. The chainsaw mill eats up thickness quickly, um, especially when you're dealing with the different shape of the tree and how it may wax and wane. Right. So, you know, you go thin and you risk wasting sawdust instead of slabs. You go thick and you risk uh, inviting moisture to uh, never leave the piece. So it's kind of a delicate balance of, and, and you well, know, I was learning on the fly on probably uh, one of the most precious trees that I've or ever will uh, kind of saw up. So, yeah, I think it's one of the things I appreciate about your work, how you, um, to the, a greater extent, try to represent the magnificence of the tree when it was living. And, I, you know, as a George Nakashima, uh, make it live again as mm. functional pieces that people can still, uh, and have, of a quality that it lasts as long as the tree did so how old well i think in order to do that, that that tree was only 80 to 100 years old it's just it's a, a bastone walnut so bastone is a variety of walnut a hybrid of of claro and english walnut that grows seven times faster than any other species it's really unique in that regard so in california they often use it as a rootstock and then they graft to it with english oh, or okay. black For walnut and and that, that's their way of um, expediting the whole process. But occasionally the bastone will just grow and uh, never get grafted onto. And then you end up with a beautiful, uh, massive, gnarly looking specimen. And the grain is just mind blowing. The hardness more, on it is double. More so than Carlo? I would argue slightly. Okay. Claro, Claro used to be my number one bastone is now. Okay. Um, but Clara's not too far behind. And then Black Walnut is way, you know, below that. So um, Garbage compared. I look at your stuff and, and I just go, I wish I'm in the wrong side of the country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. what's funny is I bought slabs from the East Coast that were cut from the West Coast and, and you know, essentially brought them back to the West Coast. Oh, really? Work on them. Yeah, I, I, I don't do it so much anymore, but early on, you know, when looking for these ugly duckling slabs, um, it, it becomes hard to find. I, I had one source and then I bought all of them. And then, you know, there weren't that many to begin with because they're lucky if you if they end up in the drying stack. And then they're even luckier if they get kiln dried. And then, you know, lucky if 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 you're able to dig them out of the pile at your uh, your slab suppliers warehouse. So, um so are you buying uh, um, from other suppliers? Not or anymore. Not no. anymore. I mean, I, I did buy some uh, musical grade Oregon uh, walnut. I think it was 10 quarter from Gobi Walnut in Oregon. Okay. And I mean, it's just mind blowingly beautiful. I couldn't resist. It was all 12 or 14 inch plus and, you know, 10 quarter. And it's just rare sam i mean sam maloof right he said don't buy don't wait for the project to buy the wood buy the right. wood when you find it because it's it's not going to be there when you need it and that has been so and you know with everything that we have here and we have a few containers outside um and then a, a stack of lumber in the back here we still struggle finding the right piece for the right project well i call that Palette. It, it, you need a palette to pick from. Yeah, I mean, or in this case, we need like like forty palettes, and 
You know, oh, it's just a, never a painter's palette. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. I see. I yeah. See. Yeah, you, you need more than you'd need for a whole project as just a source to go uh, going through. So can we can we talk about what you, you take a look at this, Jack? What? Oh, okay. So this is the this is what I want to talk about, Taylor. This the real solid stuff. Yes. So that's a log. That's a log. Well, that's that's 20% of the 10 foot tree that I was talking about, which and is bigger than most trees that people room? That's your show? Uh, that's in my client's office. That's incredible. And Taylor, tell us how it's behaved. Well, um, it continues to crack every day. Uh, hey, did... We're getting some mold in some spots. Okay. You know, it's not a good idea to leave these books like this because that's what happens. Right. But this is this is a more proper way to store them. But aside from that, I mean, you, you just sand it off and put some new oil on there and you're good to go. Because there's tons of wood left. Yeah. 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 You can never scratch that surface too deep. No. That's... Uh... I don't, I don't believe I'm aware of too many people doing that sort of a thing. And in, in of itself, that's, uh, do you, you think that you were required to do that because you were processing lumber and you saw well, it? No, it's hard to do that because most people don't have the opportunity to direct a mill to cut things the way they want to cut them. Right. Yeah. Like if, uh, how often do you, do you find the wood at a, at a lumber yard that you want? You know, you, you often have to dig do. through piles and piles to find what you need. So the only way to get that over there was to to buy the tree and and then to convince one of the most skilled lumber or so sawyers to cut it. Um, yeah, that's a tree. I mean, that, that's, All right, here. That's, that's something I'd be into. I'd be totally into that. I I, I mean... I mean, that's well, and, and Jack, I mean, look, that's a beautiful piece of wood. And think about it. You could probably, that's 30 inches tall, which I, I specifically cut to make a tabletop out of, um, table height. And then we could have probably got 30 inches, I don't know, around eight, eight or nine beautiful slabs. Yeah. So it was an inten intensely difficult decision to say, hey, let's not cut that into a bunch of pieces of wood let's do the super luxurious and arguably wasteful move which is keeping it this thick this impractical and in my opinion unique and beautiful okay let me let me address the moral part where it should be saved and should, it, should, it should represent itself my experience is trees are for nothing <clears throat> It's only when someone touches a tree that it becomes worth something. I, I'm talking money wise. <clears throat> I could buy logs left, right, and center. Logs aren't expensive. It's right. Lawyer to handle the logs and instead of the equipment to move the logs. And so, I mean, I think it's kind of brilliant in a way that you've said, well, I think it's beautiful as a log. Okay, uh, do we really need to add any more expenses to this? Well, there's this, there's this idea of, um, it's a Chinese sort of philosophical idea called the uncarved block. And more or less the idea is that you start with this block, right? Let's call it a, a 12 by 12 cube or, gotcha. or whatever. And the moment you cut into this block, <clears throat> you are essentially taking away from its perfect cubeness or whatever it's no longer a perfect cube so are you making it better or are you making it worse right and and in the case of that tree who knows we could have cut through the middle of that and found that there was a giant hole and you know rot and who knows what um we could have cut into that tree and found that it was hollow oh. uh you never know and and it's a risk that you got to take and Although the desk could still be sawed. 
True. And then, you know, the hollow presents opportunities to do other things, but having the ability and, and, and sort of the desire to like wrestle out beauty from, from ugliness. And and I use those words kind of generically, but they are in my opinion, more or less the same. Uh, That's, that's, that's where the magic is. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Um, I think Nakashima described it as you need a rag picker sense and the skill of a diamond cutter. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's funny, though, like I'll oftentimes have tables that I'm working and the Sawyer cut the tree down and he cut it however he cut it. And I'm looking at the slab and I'm like, that (laughs) is that the way the angle he cut that sometimes it's two angles or three is so perfect. Like, I don't want to take that away. And I'll oftentimes just clean it up more or less the same way that they cut it because, you know, unintentionally or somewhat intentionally, who knows, they, they did a perfect job. And, you know, it's part of the history of the tree. It's, and, so and for that, to that design, point of like not being like, your design has already started in the assemblance of the materials. So you assembling the materials is the trigger for the pieces to come. Would, would that be fair to say? Say again. Do you, is it the assembling, a uh, getting the materials, witnessing uh, the processes, and making all the decisions to get to raw materials? that initiates some of your designs or do you just go to the material afterwards? In other words, you don't know exactly what it's going to be. Maybe it's, you know, it's going to be tables or, you know, it's going to be something else in the case of that log. Right. 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 I I was just creating like a generic opportunity there. Like a table could be a desk or a conference table. But it's inches tall. So you had to make a decision that it's, Right. If I cut that at 20 inches, boom, table's out of the question. If what I else? cut that at 40 inches, well, that's kind of wasteful to do 40. I mean, 30 is still wasteful to some degree. Are but you making decisions while, while images are emerging from the sawing? Okay. So in that particular case, if I remember correctly, we were cutting slabs, the biggest and baddest slabs out of that piece. And we reached a point where the table was, or the the chunk was still massive. And we had to decide, do we stop or do we keep going? And and I saw the grain on the top because that was freshly sawn. And I was like, this is just gorgeous grain. Um, Whatever we cut beyond this will be just as gorgeous. But I looked at the shape of it and the mass of it, and I just said, wouldn't this be the most killer table ever if we left it as it was? And how often do you get the opportunity to do that? A 10-foot wide table out of a single piece. I mean, I just thought of, like, imagine sitting at this table and what that would be like. And that really led it all, so... So I see you've been doing a lot more solid work. Uh, I'm talking the scale of the yeah, like what I'm sitting at now, beyond ten inches thick, like like the the whole tree represented there. Yeah. Can you talk about how difficult it is to um, well just handle? Oh my gosh! So what's what's so interesting about these pieces is not. Part of the fun of making them, and it's it's probably the most grueling process ever because we're outside chainsawing for hours on end, and the chainsaw is heavy, and you're digging it into the wood, and you don't really know what the fuck you're doing, and you have a plan, and then it goes haywire, and then you're like, hey, I need to turn this, you know, 2,000-pound sla- uh, chunk of wood on its back, but I've cut it, so I don't want to uh, mess up the cut portions but I got to use this giant forklift in order to, to turn it. You know, how do we do that? And, and it's this like kind of in the moment engineering, for lack of a better word, where we decide like, this is how we flip it. And I think it'll work, but it might not. 
And sometimes it's just a matter of driving a forklift fairly quick, quickly into the side of it. And, and what, are, what, are, what kind of wood are we looking at here? This is uh, pomelay, I believe, blue gum eucalyptus. Okay. And, uh, interesting, just... interesting bark. Oh, it's that's that's what drew uh, drew me to this this particular piece of wood. And like you know, maybe one out of ten thousand trees will have that kind of character. And that's not bark. That is actually that's the Cambian layer, eh? That's... Correct. Correct. <laughs> the bark is just as gorgeous and interesting. So we're actually casting a large piece of bark into a bronze sculpture from this oh and par beautiful. partly what i want to do is is cast the bark and then reattach it to a tree at some point um and and what what it what is it is it producing a boily grain on flats on the grain is not super interesting i mean eucalyptus is kind of bland you could kind of see it here um i mean it's it's fairly interesting it's not quarter saw necessarily it looks road a little bit yeah but eucalyptus is just so uh, it's like tone on tone so you can't really see the um see the the sort of grain patterns what you can see is that the wood cracks the shit and um so it's you, know, all you can't you can't use this stuff in fine furniture jb blanc made a table out of it and uh that table was being sold for over three hundred thousand dollars and I sat at the table with my client who's considering uh, buying it. And, you know, one of the corners of the table was raising 12 inches. So very, like, no joke. You put it, you put a, a plate on there and it would slide off. Like oh. you literally could not sit at that table. And, um, you know, again, like, does a table have to be flat? Uh, in that case, it was not flat to the point where it was borderline unusable and still worth over a quarter million dollars. Right. Very interesting. Yeah, so in this I, case- I love how you've, it's, it's, it's almost your, you've, you've taken and extended that chair inside that. Out mm -hmm. to the, of course, at the worst place to do it would be Enray. <laughs> friggin' awful to do, right? Yeah. But it's so excellent. Uh, I, I mean, I just love that part of it. That you don't, you don't consider what's easy to do. Do you no. do hard because they're hard and represent a skill there? Say again? Do you sometimes decide to do things just because they're hard and it represents a skill? No, I, I would say never. Um, I'm doing something not because it's hard, but because it needs to be done to achieve whatever it is that I'm trying to achieve. And, and the only way to do it to the sort of level of the piece is to do it perfectly. So that lends itself to only one or two solutions and only one usually fits the overall style of the piece itself. What are you using for power equipment to excavate the wood? I used to mention chainsaws, but you're obviously... Yeah, this one was a chainsaw. We used an uh, angle grinder with an Arbortech wheel on it, and then we yeah. used um, a router, actually, and we built a, a custom router sled to flatten the back of this so that it was dead flat because, okay. you know, it was important for me to have this perfectly flat, to have this piece perfectly flat and then to have this thing protruding out from it yeah it's, um, it. it's excellent it's excellent it, it, the seat really emerges from the tree from within the tree rather than um, being inserted into it or cut from it necessarily i see only the negative of the chair mm. um i don't really see a chair in it although i see the chair but i see it as a negative it, it's, mm. it's as if the chair was pushed in the plaster scene and then removed. <laughs> well, you know what the chair is? It's the human body. Uh, that was the byproduct of us sitting in it over probably a thousand times and, just, and saying, well, it felt fantastic. Yeah. And, and I had every scale of person on my team from me at 150 to one of our bigger guys at over 200 sitting in it until it fit everyone comfortably. And we, we managed to achieve that. And then this block here is, is a rock, is a big piece of granite 
that I found at a local uh, stone yard. And I found it almost immediately. It was kind of uh, the shape that I had in my mind. And uh, it just happened to be there down the street, just uh, five minutes down the street. And, and you really, polished, you did the polished f facets? Yeah, that's so that's um, aluminum bronze, which has this incredible texture, if you can see it. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's almost scale-like, like an alligator. That's because, that's because that's, so what it is, is that's a bearing bronze. That's yes. my favorite bronze. It's amazing. Yeah, and so you know what creates that pattern is, is a drawing it from a. Uh, well, it's not. It's not melted down. The bronze is liquid, but the particles. So it's a matrix of a whole bunch of alloys, and the particles are are not quite liquid, and so that, that's what that flowing is. It's the. It's the. It's those other particles that are more semi-solid than the liquid bronze. It's a beautiful pattern. I, it yeah, looks and, good. and you know what's funny is like I think I bought that from McMaster or something. I, I can't yeah, remember. Bronze. Yeah, and they say you know we we build this oversized. It's a few thousandths oversized so that you can mill it on your mill to yeah. whatever dimension because it's meant yeah. to be used for whatever. So. Uh, well, I saw here, that and I was like, there's no way I'm throwing that away. But the one in intervention, which we had to cut it at some point, was to cut it and then provide this really nice polished surface. To well, it's, 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 a, it's a rich color. Uh, you should look into some of the Ampco bronzes. I think you would love their color even more. Really? Uh, that's my favorite metal. Uh, absolutely. Bronze. Yeah, bearing bronze. Bearing bronze. I love bronze in general uh, yeah, because it, it can withstand water. It's it's almost as hard as steel uh, or as rigid, yet it has the beautiful depth given by the copper. Yeah, very warm. Mm -hmm. Very, very warm. Okay, so... Um, so what's interesting about this piece real quick is that we were just sitting and this kind of tells you about the process. We were just sitting in the parking lot and we kind of just shoved this piece up against that one. And by the way, they were all cut from the same circular chunk. Right. And uh, we, we realized that because this bark is so chunky and kind of three dimensional that um, inserting this piece interlocked into this piece and actually held it up while we were ch uh, chainsawing and, and um, carving into it. So it, it was just a realization when we took a few steps back and we're like, wait a second, you know, that's actually kind of interesting. And then we put this one here to keep this one from sliding out that way. And then we wanted to maintain that here, but I ended up having to add these two brass rods into the concrete because it's smoother inside. Outside, we were on asphalt. And right. uh, in here, this, this piece wanted to kick out so that way. Sort of locked it. Yeah, and but that, now you could stand on that, it and, and nothing will happen. And, and so these all belong to the piece as uh, uh, the whole thing's the artifact. I think, yeah. I think you refer to this as on, on your IG as clustering. Uh-huh. Yes. Could you, and you, you described another thing called skip, uh, strike skip? Strike slip, yeah. What, explain what that is. So strike slip was kind of a fascination with um, a specific type of earthquake. I'll bring you back to my shop now. And uh, the thing that's interesting about this earthquake is the way in which it, it shifts the earth. Um, right. Typically, the earth will shift either vertically or at an angle vertically. And uh, sorry, I got locked out here. Let me get back in. And what's interesting about the strike slip is you'll oftentimes see, you'll see the, uh, the earth shift along a road or along a railroad in some cases. Let me see if I can find a piece of chalk. Um, yeah, here's one. And uh, say there's, you know, 
a road like this, right? And there happens to be a, a fault line right here. So what will happen on a strike slip earthquake is that the road will start there and end up over there with some level of destruction in the middle. But, but rather defined in a line. Yes. And with, that, with railroad tracks, it's really interesting because the, uh, the edges of the track will bend along the fault line. You can okay. Google it and check them out. They're just so, I mean, devastating yet gorgeous to look at. And I had the idea with, with making a subtle intervention in a piece of wood. In this case, this is a 20-inch um, square log that's uh, about eight feet long <clears throat> that we'll make into a bench at some point. But I love the idea of doing one minimal intervention into the piece um, and then revealing parts of the wood that would normally go unseen. Like if we left this as a square, right? Right. You, you would never know what the center of that log looks like. You would never have seen this. You know, in some cases like this, we found a walnut happened to slice right through it. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. And, and then shifting it, you know, slightly up kind of reveals that. So... You know, that, that one was probably the largest one we've done to date. And in resemblance to this earth. So taking the full form and, and just shifting. Right. Oh, there's a great example. Right. And, it, it, you know, I love seeing it on top here. Yeah, the end grains. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you see well, how you they... See, you can see it's a single piece. Right. Clearly. Like that, that's, you know, it's interesting to look at that, of course, but when you shift it, you can also make the grain line up in interesting ways that it normally wouldn't have and create different patterns, which is more of a subtle thing, but um, it, it keeps us kind of excited about it. So we oh, have a cluster of those there. I, I, I think it, it, it appears to be your current work at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean... This one is uh, probably the largest one we've finished so far. And it has these hidden fasteners um, because they weren't interested in ever shifting it from predetermined shape that I created. Right. Uh, and that was one way to lock it in together. And then adding, you know, a few, you might call them ornamental, but really you could see how these cracks really begin to penetrate almost directly through or almost entirely through here, where I think corsets are, are reinforcing the cracks is kind of a necessity. Um, you know, you could see how that might actually continue and break off altogether. Yeah. What, are you going to add corsets to those? The, the I will. Grass? I will. Yeah, I'm going to add maybe one here. Um, and maybe one on this side as well, or two. And how do you think your your original corset design is going to hold up to wood that isn't necessarily two inches thick now and movement is? That's them, eh? That's it right there. So this one I patinaed slightly to, for, my, for my client's request. But you can see how we do them. And what is the, what's the fastener there that's peened in? That's a uh, aluminum rivet that we okay. hammer, peen, chisel, sand, polish. But it'll have a bit of give. Mm, a little bit. I mean, not really, to be honest. Okay. These are, these are strong as shit. I've never broken one. Okay. And I've tried. I've tried a few times. So how, uh, so what do you do? Just, you just, do you drill two holes? Do you have a jig? Well, yeah, I drill two holes and then I route an eighth inch line between them, perfectly that, centered. It is. The trick is getting it perfect. And uh, if you mess up, the brass actually does give a little bit. But, um, uh, you know, every time I make a mistake, I, I take it personally and I get <laughs> mad either at myself or whoever did it, which is, you know, always a, a tough thing to deal with for everyone. But. Well, it's quite fine. So uh, it would be like fitting hinges and stuff. You, you don't want gaps. Right. Right. Very, very interesting.
Um, who in architecture uh, do, that's t like, do you like Frank Gehry? Um, Frank Gehry's, yeah, he's cool. I like Frank Gehry. I don't, I don't love Frank Gehry. I don't hate Frank Gehry. I just, um, who would you say who's doing architecture today? Uh, you appreciate or well, this guy's the man, but he's already or, dead. Who? Um, this guy right here, Carlos Scarpa is the man. Yeah. Uh, he was Italian, uh, mid century, um, slightly after Frank Lloyd Wright, but still living at the same time. They did meet and, um, he died, I think in, in his fifties in Japan, I think in Tokyo in a car accident. Oh, wow. Kind of a really unfortunate thing because he was just such a master in every single aspect. But, you know, as far as who's alive today, well, that's tough because my favorite um, architect, uh, who I think his house is better than Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, actually. Granted, it was after it, uh, was Ray Cappy. Okay. He's a California architect. I had the pleasure of seeing his house and, and meeting him there and interviewing him. And uh, spatially, you know, I like to think that you could understand a architect's brain by looking at a section of their house. Okay. And if you look at Ray Cappy's section drawing of his house, it will just be the most insane thing you've ever seen the way he integrated his house into the landscape, the hillside. He was the first person to figure out how to do it and just totally blew it out of the water. He, he founded, uh, partly founded SciArc in the um, AIA of Southern California. He's a, he's a big deal. But he died uh, a few, few months ago. So uh, Taylor, where, do you see yourself in a couple of years? That's a good question. It changes every day. Uh, I don't know. I My furniture is starting to get in integrated into the architecture of buildings and um, I'd like to continue to explore that opportunity where the building becomes a piece of furniture, not the other way around uh, in the sense that a furniture, a piece of furniture can spatially act like a building like in the chair that we just looked at yeah. where you where you embody the space of the chair uh much like a building envelops your body you know a piece of furniture can really envelop you as well but um integrating furniture into the building itself is has always been a fascinating idea and building a building as a piece of furniture meaning that the detailing of it would be built to the level, you know, like Sam Maloof's house or maybe George Nakashima's house to some degree, uh, Wendell Castle's house. Yeah. You know, their staircases are, are particularly um, uh, showing all those, those fine levels of furniture yeah. level detail. Showing, that? It's showing their character. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I bet you'll get there. No, no question about it. Um, um, I'm super grateful to have been able to talk to you. Yeah, and likewise. I should like actually to talk to you again more on the architectural and the design side. If we could get together and, and talk either on your, your IG live or my IG live. Sure. Uh, but maybe we should end it and, uh, I'll save it and make sure that this is at least archived to uh, uh, Richard's site. Okay. And uh, Taylor, thank you so much for uh, spending the time with me today and sharing with the, the world. Uh, we had quite a few people uh, join us. And so uh, tag your group. I'll tag mine to tell them to come over and watch this. All right. Fortunately, I'm really discouraged that we lost the first. I don't know. Yeah, what... that was, uh, that was that a great, was awesome. great combo. But um, there will be uh, plenty more to come, I think. Okay, well, peace, brother. All right.
Take Keep it, it real. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat>